Uh, Father, thank you for your goodness. Thank you that we can gather here as your people. And we pr pray that by your Holy Spirit, you'll be guiding us to hear your word afresh this day. Heavenly Father, please help me speak what is true and for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I know some of you have read this book. Uh, I, I, I kind of tokenly, I'm one of those people that reads ebooks, so mine's on my phone. Not very helpful if you're not in the front row. But this book is called Being the Bad Guys How to Live for Jesus in a World That Says You Shouldn't by Stephen McAlpine. Uh, it's a book that's only come out in the last couple of years and has been getting uh, great reviews. Uh, and in that book, uh, Stephen McAlpine tells a story about Ernest Shackleton. Uh, Shackleton was an Antarctic uh, explorer at the turn of the last century. If you want to know more about him, Jan Crom is the resident expert on Ernest Shackleton. Uh, you can ask her for more info about him later. But anyway, he was one of those you know, kind of slightly crazy people who, who were exploring the Antarctic. He probably would have enjoyed that football game at minus 34 degrees. Uh, but when he was doing his exploring, he needed people to help. He needed people to come along on the journey with him. So apparently, the legend says, he put an advertisement in one of the papers. This was his advertisement to try and entice people to join him on his expedition. There we go. Men wanted for hazardous journey. Low wages, bitter cold, long hours of complete darkness, safe return, doubtful, honour and recognition in event of success. Apparently 5,000 men put in applications to come along on that journey. I don't know if that says more about how the world has changed in the past hundred years, because I have a sneaking suspicion not many men of my generation are putting their hand up, and I don't think many of the women are either, to go along on that journey if they read that. I mean, it's not gonna be, A, we don't read the newspaper, but if it was on Facebook or whatever, I still don't think it's getting many likes, and let alone people who are responding to say, yep, yeah, I'm in. And yet 5,000 put in applications. You can see the wisdom in why he, he worded it that way. No one who, who signed up for it was going to be complaining when suddenly they turned up and said, why is it so cold here in Antarctica? Where'd the sun go? And, and when, you know, the general, you know, they were unlikely to return, I guess they couldn't complain. They knew they probably weren't going to make it back. Intriguingly, we are starting a series uh, today where we're going to be looking in Mark's Gospel. Kind of the, the crazy bit about this year is that Easter is really early this year, so we're kind of already on our, on our journey towards Easter Sunday, and God willing, we'll get to Mark chapter 16 at the appropriate date, uh, but, and look at the resurrection on the day of the resurrection. But we are going to see this journey of, of, of Jesus on his way to the cross, and we're going to hear Jesus call his people to follow him. And even though we live in, in a day and age where so often our, 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 our means of trying to evangelise, our means of trying to call people to, to become Christians and to follow Jesus sounds nothing like this, where we seem to say to people that if you want your best life, you want things to be great, you want everything to be a time of blessing, then come and join us following Jesus. We're actually going to hear Jesus say something that sounds awfully like the call of Shackleton. And that's the call that he makes to us. So we're going to jump right in and we're going to hear all about the king who came to serve and the king who calls us to follow. Uh, because we are jumping in in, in in the middle of Mark's gospel, it's probably helpful for us to get this sort of quick understanding of what's going on. Mark's gospel essentially divides into two halves, and basically where we're starting off our series today is the passage that straddles the two halves of his gospel. The first half is asking the question, who is this man? 
And the second half is asking the questions, well, what has this man come to do and what does that then mean for us? And, and so the first half of, of Mark's gospel is asking that question, who is this man? Mark skips the backstory, which we focused on so much at Christmas time. He doesn't have any of the birth narratives or any of the growing up narratives. He has none of the backstory, but he gets straight into the, the adult ministry in the life of Jesus. And so as the readers of Mark's gospel, as we read all these accounts of the Lord Jesus, we find ourselves asking the question, who is this man? Who is this man who, when he calls, fishermen drop their nets and follow him? Who is this man who can cast out evil spirits? Who is this man who has the power to forgive sins and cause a paralysed man to be able to walk again? Who is this man who associates with and, 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 and eats with sinners? Who is this man who can teach with authority? Who is this man who can still the raging storm that even the wind and the waves obey him? Who is this man that, that when, a, when a woman bleeding for 12 years who could receive no help, when she would just touch him, she would be made well? Who is this man who, who causes a dead girl to rise again? Who is this man who can feed thousands upon thousands of people with a few loaves of bread and some fish? and have leftovers? Who is this man who walks on water? Who is this man who causes the blind to see? And so with that in mind, we get to our reading this morning. When funnily enough, it's actually Jesus who asks that question of his followers. We're told that Jesus and his disciples, they went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked them, who do people say I am? How are they answering the question, who is this man? And, and, and the disciples answer, well, well, some say you're John the Baptist, you're the, the one who baptised you and was had his head lopped off by Herod. And, and some people say you're Elijah, that great prophet from the Old Testament. And still others say you're just one of the prophets. You're, you're pretty up there, but not quite. We're going we're gonna to give you a title. But then Jesus asked them, well, what about you? What about you who have been following me around for, for this probably couple of years by now? Who do you say I am? And Peter makes this incredible statement. He says, Jesus, you are the Messiah. You are the Christ. What does it mean? You are the King. You are the King that we have been waiting literally a thousand years to come. You are the hope of Israel. You are the one who is going to make everything that's wrong in the world right again. You are the one who's going to get rid of the Romans who are here in the land making life miserable for us all. You are God's king and we are your followers. This is an incredible moment. This is the moment where the question is being answered. Who is this man that has done all these remarkable things? He is the king of the kingdom. But then something rather shocking happens. Because you expect the king to then talk about, all right, well, what does the king come to do? And so this is what we expect him, Jesus, to say in his next words. Jesus began to teach them that the Son of Man must be glorified and be accepted by all the elders and the chief priests and the teachers of the law as he goes out and kills God's enemies and begins his triumphal reign. That's what it says in the ESV, uh, the expected saviour version of the Bible. That's what we're anticipating Jesus to say. But unfortunately, he didn't quite say that, at least from the perspective of the disciples who were right there in front of him. Of course, what did he say? He taught them that the Son of Man, that's one of Jesus' favourite self-titles, it, it, it goes back to a, a, a story in Daniel chapter 7, we'll talk about more later, but he, he says, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. 
And we're told that Jesus spoke plainly about the fact that he had to die. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. Uh, We're told that after Peter rebuked him, Jesus turned, looked at his disciples, rebuked Peter and said, Get behind me, Satan. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Uh, It's an extraordinary scene, isn't it, when you think about it? Jesus asked who I am. Peter declares, you're the king. You're the Messiah. You're the one we've been waiting for. When Jesus then says, well, what what, what I'm going to do as the Messiah, Peter then thinks, actually, Jesus, let's just have a word. I think you've got this wrong. Yes, you are God's chosen king, but you clearly don't know what you're doing. And to be fair to Peter, it kind of makes sense that that's how he responded. Because this declaration of Jesus that he had come to die sounded like absolute foolishness. It sounded ridiculous. It was the complete opposite expectation that anyone had. And this has actually been consistent with how people have responded to to Jesus being the servant king throughout history. The cross has always been a scandalous thing. It was scandalous to the disciples. We we hear Paul talk in 1 Corinthians when he says that we preach Christ crucified, which is a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. Uh, One of the best uh, uh, demonstrations of how foolish the cross has been throughout history uh, comes from one of the most ancient graffitis that we have, that we can still look at today. Uh, This uh, graffiti comes from uh, an ancient Roman ruin. It's found in the Palatine Hill, so just down the road from the Colosseum in Rome. Uh, We found this uh, on a wall in a room. Now, you're looking at that and going, I can't make out a thing. Good point. So someone scribbled over it and they came up with this. And what is this? It's it's called the Alexamenos Graffiti. Uh, It was basically, it depicts this man. So on your left is this man, Alexamenos, worshipping another man. And you can see the man who he's worshipping. He's on a cross and he has a a human-ish body and a donkey's head. And the scribble below it is Greek for Alexamenos worships his God. What's it saying? It's saying that in 200 AD, your typical Roman thought that a Christian was a fool who worshipped a donkey on a cross. Because what's wrong with you if you think your God died on a cross? He may as well be a donkey is what the basic message was all the way back in roughly 200 AD. The cross was absolute foolishness to the world at the time. And honestly, it is still scandalous in our time, isn't it? Today, of course, the the scandal isn't so much that Jesus died. I think our over-familiarity with the story of Easter means we can accept that. But there are a couple of prominent prominent scandals it still causes. One of them is that he had to die at all. You see, for so many, the notion of a God who holds the world accountable for their sins is shocking. Because our world says, surely we are free to live and free to act in whatever way we see fit. As long as we we, 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 we don't choose to harm other people, We ought to be free to do whatever we wish if it makes us, me, feel happy. And so the idea that we are sinners whose only hope is putting our hope and trust in this Messiah who suffered and died to take our punishment that our sins deserve so that we might have life, this this is shocking. This is scandalous news that a God may not approve of all of my behaviour. The other scandal of the cross, unfortunately, probably happens within the church. Because we do live in a day and an age where the the message of the gospel that is often preached is anything but a call to follow the suffering Messiah. So often the gospel that we hear preached is one that says that 
following Jesus should mean a life of this abundance, this life of power, this life of glory, this life where everything will go well for you. But it doesn't quite make sense that we're called to follow a Messiah who died on a cross. And the cross ends up becoming a scandal even within the church. Friends, the first thing we're hearing this morning and what we're going to hear throughout this series is that we have a king who is the servant king, the king who dies so that we might have life. And he's a king who calls us to follow him. After this scene with, 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 with Peter rebuking Jesus, then Jesus rebuking Peter in return, Jesus then and starts answering that question of, well, what, is, what does him dying on the cross mean for us? What is it that he calls us to do in response? And so we're told Jesus called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, whoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. It's fairly clear, isn't it? If anyone wants to be a follower of Jesus, which is another way of saying, if you are a Christian, then what's your life meant to be? It's meant to be a life of denying yourself, taking up your cross and following. On a simple level, I think we understand just the words, follow me, follow Jesus. But, but what does it mean to deny yourself? And what does this expression to take up your cross actually signify? What's it talking about? What, what, what did that, those words mean? Well, denying yourself is to completely change the way you view the world and to view your life. Instead of life being about how our world tells us that ultimately the, the ultimate God is, is self, is you, and whatever your desires are, you should go and fulfil, do whatever will best please you, it's actually completely changing your centre of gravity from yourself to the will of God. And so it's going to mean actually doing something that, 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 that is controversial in our society. It's saying no. Saying no to some of our desires. Saying no when our desires have a, 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 a contrary to what actually God desires for you. And this change is going to affect every area of your life. We're then told we are to pick up our cross in Jesus' time. What did people understand? If you saw someone carrying their cross, you knew what was going on. That was a person under the sentence of death. This was a person carrying their cross, carrying the item that they are about to be executed with to the site that they would die at. If you saw somebody in Jesus' time carrying a cross, you were effectively seeing a dead man walking. Death was imminent. They had no life to call their own. And followers of Jesus are like that. They have no life to call their own. They have handed control of their lives to the Lord Jesus. It's as if Jesus is saying, if you're going to be one of my disciples, then you are mine to do with as I wish. To deny yourself and pick up your cross and follow Jesus is Jesus telling us we are to completely hand over the reins of control of our lives to him. We are to consider ourselves dead. Which actually makes the whole denying yourself thing rather easy. Because the funny thing about dead people is that they don't have desires. Dead people aren't selfish. Dead people don't disobey. Dead people are dead to self. But then we, we, okay, we understand those words, but, but we still have to make it clear who they're actually talking about, don't they? Because I think sometimes, I don't know about you, but when you're reading the Bible and when you're hearing things like this, you find ways of reading it just to make sure it doesn't quite apply to you. And so we'll read this and we'll read Jesus say, whoever wants to be the next missionaries, the next Morris and Amanda in Cambodia, well, they are to deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Or whoever wants to be a, a leader of a church, they must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow me. Or whoever is 
Well, unlike me, they have a pretty stable life circumstances. Things are going all right in their world. If, if you're in a situation where you can deny yourself, then go ahead and deny yourself and take it across. But if things are a bit tr tricky at the moment, don't worry about it. I think we basically try and read it as whoever not named Joel Nankervis must deny themselves and take up their cross. Or whoever not named Jan Crom must deny themselves and take up their cross and follow. Or whoever not named, and I think you know whose name you have to insert in there. We find any way of making sure these words don't apply to us. But friends, what Jesus says is actually rather clear cut, isn't it? There's no ifs, there's no buts, there's no except, there's no unless, there's no sort of sub-clauses anywhere there to try and get your own. It, it, it's simple. Whoever, whoever wants to be my disciple must do these things. In fact, in Luke's gospel, there's sort of added emphasis there because it actually says that whoever wants to be my disciple must daily, daily deny themselves and take up their cross and follow. Not just one time event, but, but it's a continual lifestyle of choosing to deny ourselves, consider ourselves in a sense dead in our following, in not doing our own will, but, but doing God's will. It means every decision of every day as we live with this attitude. It affects how we use our time. I don't know about you, but I, I've often said things like, I didn't have, have time today to, 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 to pray. I, I didn't quite have enough time today to find time to read God's Word. And yet, I did find time to go on Facebook. And I did have find time to just sit down and have a coffee and read, read a book. I did find time to, to, to watch several episodes on TV. I did find time to watch that football game at minus 34 degrees. A life of self-denial means using our time in a way that will most glorify Jesus. A life of self-denial means following Jesus not just on Sunday, but from Monday through Sunday, 365 days a year. A life of self-denial means following Jesus will actually impact every area of our life. It'll impact our marriages. It'll impact our parenting decisions. It'll impact our friendships. It'll impact how we relate to our neighbours. It'll impact our business dealings. It'll impact how we treat others at school. A life of self-denial is, is a life where we, we're going to be continually asking ourselves a question that we spoke about for those of you here last week. And I know it's January and many of you weren't. But last week we, I, I, I threw out an acronym for you that was, uh, I, I said there's what would Jesus do and I kind of suggested Jesus would perform a miracle. But instead the acronym is WWPJ. What would please Jesus a life of self-denial is a life of, of continually asking that question in every circumstance we're in. What would please Jesus? How should I relate to this person in a way that will please Jesus? How should I spend my time in a way that will please Jesus? How will I deny myself and do the will of the Lord Jesus wherever I am? Friends, a life of self-denial will come at a cost. And so the question is, is that cost worth it? Is this life worth it for you? Well, in a few moments' time, we're going to hear Jesus tell us why this life of costly discipleship is worth it. And he's going to do so uh, by telling one of history's greatest paradoxes. Uh, it's one of those English lessons for the morning. Uh, paradoxes, for those who are scratching our heads and trying to remember uh, what that means. A paradox is a, basically a statement where the logic of the statement is inconsistent. The logic of the statement doesn't actually make sense, but the purpose of a good paradox is to kind of highlight a deeper truth. Right? There's lots of these in society. We say them all the time. Uh, there's ones like, Nobody goes to that restaurant, it's too crowded. Right? You see the paradox there. Or, or the one thing I know in life is that I know nothing. Uh, one of the most famous ones from literature last century was George Orwell's one in Animal Farm when he said, all animals are equal, 
But some animals are more equal than others. Well, what we're going to hear is Jesus tell us that whoever wants to save their life will lose their life. But whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will save it. Listen to the Lord Jesus' words here. He says, whoever wants to save their life will lose it. But whoever loses their life for me and the gospel will save it. What good is it for someone to gain the whole world yet forfeit their soul? Or what can anyone give in exchange for their soul? If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when he comes in his Father's glory with the holy angels. It's an incredible paradox, isn't it? If you want to save your life now, then you're going to lose it. But if you're willing to lose your life now, you will save it. What's he saying? He's saying that if you want to save your life now, if you want to live for this life, for yourself, for your own purposes, for your own pleasures, for your own popularity, for your own desires, then fine, you can live that way. You might end up having seemingly the most pleasurable and popular life. But ultimately, you will lose your life and have no life in the life to come. Entrance to the kingdom of God will be denied. Yet if you're willing to lose your life now, if you're willing to deny yourself and take up your cross, then in actual fact you will gain life. You will receive salvation. You will enter the kingdom of God. In verse 36 and 37, he says it again. What good is it for you to gain the whole world but lose your soul? What can you exchange for your soul? There's a famous saying that really sums up the attitude of so many folk that modern society live by. He or she who has the most toys wins. The saying is saying, whoever ends up with the most success in life, whoever gets the most wealth, whoever has the nicest cars, whoever lives in the largest property, whoever eats the finest food, whoever has the most social media followers, whoever travels the most exotic places, they are the winner in life. They are the people where to aspire to be like. But hear how foolish the attitude is. Hear the Lord Jesus' words really clearly. These things are ultimately meaningless, absolutely meaningless. What good is it if you've gained the whole world, if you've become the most powerful person in the world, if in the end you lose your soul? What can you exchange for your soul? The answer to that question is nothing. Absolutely nothing. No wealth, no status, no jump the queue to heaven because you're an A-list celebrity. The only way to have life is to lose your life now. If you're to do the, 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 the kind of pros and cons list, I know some of you do that when you're making big decisions in life, then Jesus is presenting two choices that are rather, that are rather clear. In choice A, the, the, the pros column, you get life here and now. You gain the whole world. You avoid the shame of being associated with Jesus. You avoid the shame of having graffitis drawn up about you, of you worshipping your donkey-headed God on a cross. The cons are, though, that you lose your salvation, you lose your soul, and Jesus will be ashamed of you. The other choice in the cons column Will you deny yourself? You lose your life here and now due to following Jesus and his gospel. But in the pros, there's salvation and entry to the kingdom of God. What choice will we make? It's a choice that's worth it, though. To go back to that, that, that newspaper ad from the start from our, 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 our southern explorer, Shackleton, 
Men wanted for hazardous journey, low wages, bitter cold, long hours, complete darkness, safe return, doubtful. Honour and recognition in event of success. And what we've effectively heard is Jesus say the same thing, haven't we? He hasn't talked about our wages, hasn't talked about hours of complete darkness, but the essence is the same. But there's one key difference that should cause us to want to sign up. For Shackleton's men, safe return was doubtful. Because it really was pretty crazy what the sort of expeditions they're trying to do. But actually, when Jesus calls us to follow, even though we may lose our life now, safe return is always guaranteed. It may not be a safe return in the here and now, but it is a safe return in eternity. And it is guaranteed for us. And so for the question for us, as we finish up, is what will we do? Do you want to save your life? Then you must lose your life. It's pretty simple, really. We have these two options. We can live as the world tells us to live. We can save our life now. We can have all the pleasures of this world, but ultimately lose our life. Or we can lose our life now and ultimately save it by denying ourselves and taking up our cross and following the Lord Jesus, the one who would suffer and die for all the times when we fail to live his way. Denying self, taking up our cross, following Jesus. We lose our life now, but we gain life everlasting in his kingdom. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your son. We thank you for the Lord Jesus, the one who would suffer in our place, the one who would completely uh, change our expectations of what your king was meant to do. We thank you that he calls us to follow him and so we pray that by your spirit you'll help us follow him that you'll help us be people who deny ourselves and take up our crosses and follow. That we'll care less about the here and now and care ultimately about being with you in glory. That we'll be willing to suffer shame as we align ourselves with your son and that we will follow him all our days. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.